Welcome and good morning. Good morning. I'll try it again. Maybe we can say good morning together. So on the count of three, one, two, three, can we say good morning? Oh, that sounds much better. But since we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, let's add a little extra to it. Can we say Aquaba? Say it with a little confidence, Aquaba. That means welcome in Twi, a language that was spoken in Ghana. So why do I start with a good morning and a welcome? Because oftentimes we forget that. In Minnesota, we start talking about the Vikings and the weather, and we never look each other in the eye and start with a critical piece. So the first challenge that I give you is start with a little good morning or maybe a quaba to catch someone's attention. But we're excited to have you here today because we believe in the power of partnerships. So the Diversity Insights Breakfast is made possible through the partnerships between the University of St. Thomas, which is the Office for Diversity and Inclusion, the Forum on Workplace Inclusion, and also through our sponsor, Best Buy. So I'm excited as I look around to see all of your smiling faces and to have the opportunity to meet each and every one of you, I hope, to thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for being an ambassador and a gladiator for justice. So when we think about why are we here today, I think Malcolm X captured it best. He said education is the passport for the future. So when we look at our mission and conviction here at the University of St. Thomas, we talk about the common good. We also make a pledge to build a more just and inclusive society. And education must be the foundation of that. So as we gather here today, this is a moment for us to pause and reflect. And you can look at the theme that's at your table about bridging the gap as our annual theme, and also an invitation that we hope to see you in April to continue this process of education and justice building together. Now, a little bit about the history and mission of who we are as the Forum on Workplace and Inclusion. You see the message here, engaging people, advancing ideas, and igniting change. So when we think about this, this is truly a call to action. This is not something that we can do as individuals. This is something that we must do collectively to bring forth systems change. And how do we do this at the Forum? Through educational opportunities. Whether it's through our webinars or our annual conference, it is a time for us to engage, to build those innovative ideas that help to lay the foundation for a more just and inclusive society. So when we think about the history, we're going into our 31st year. So I think we should give the Forum staff a round of applause for 31 years of success. That means that we reach 600, uh, 1,600 attendees each year through our conference. That's 45 states that we reach. And since we learned a new word today from a different country, 14 countries. So this is an opportunity for us, for our students, our faculty, and our staff, for each professional under the sound of my voice, for us to build some new skills in our toolbox to make diversity, equity, and inclusion not just words that we speak of, but the reality. As I said, education is a passport for the future. Malcolm X's vision was to create a future of a more just world. So it starts with us coming together. So let this be more than a conversation, but a clarion call to action. I now have the honor to introduce our leader, our visionary leader who is trying to make all of these things come alive, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our curriculum, in our recruitment, our retention, and also in our community engagement. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to President Julie Sullivan. Thank you, Dr. Tyner, and good morning. <laughs> Uh, it's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you for today's Diversity Insights Breakfast. Uh, we're really pleased to be hosting this breakfast, and I had the opportunity to uh, greet many of you individually over the past half hour or so, and I'm just so delighted that so many of you have come from so many different organizations around the Twin Cities uh, to really learn more and reinforce and deepen your own commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in your organization, so thank you. We are honored to have St. Paul Mayor Melvin Carter with us today, and joining Mayor Carter are several of his staff, Tony Newborn and Andrea Turner, as well as consultant Scott Hammond. Currently, the city of St. Paul is facing two major challenges high rates of retirement among its citizens, as well as a disconnect in the diversity of its citizens and the diversity of its public servants. 
Mayor Carter wants to change this. He has asked Tony and Andrea and their teams to develop strategies to diversify the city's workforce, retain people of color and women, and authentically build relationships with community organizations through a lens of equity and inclusion. I am eager to learn more about their work, and it's a great privilege to have them sharing it with us this morning. I want to take the opportunity to personally thank Mayor Carter for his leadership. The University of St. Thomas is not only one of the city of St. Paul's oldest residents, but we are also one of its largest constituencies. And I'm pleased to say that the university has already begun to work with Mayor Carter. We are collaborating with him to create a college savings account for every child born in St. Paul. And we support his efforts to raise the minimum wage in St. Paul. Recently, Mayor Carter joined me at an event on our St. Paul campus to support a young student, a young St. Thomas student, who was a victim of a hateful, racially motivated act on our St. Paul campus. Mayor Carter is walking with us as we grapple with how to support our students and continue to deepen our commitment to end bias and racism on our campus and in our community. Later today, we are holding an all-campus educational forum where we will commit to a plan of action. I appreciate his support and his leadership as we go forward. One of St. Paul's proudest recent initiatives, excuse me, one of St. Thomas's, sorry. We, but I hope St. Paul is proud of it as well. But one of St. Thomas's proudest recent initiatives, I want to take a few moments just to tell you about it, is the creation of the Doherty Family College. And the Doherty Family College is uh, located right here on this on our Minneapolis campus in terms of where our faculty, staff, and students reside. However, they are also quite present and active on our St. Paul campus as well. So the Doherty Family College was founded two years ago. The college came about because we were and still are determined to do our part to reduce the educational attainment and prosperity gaps in Minnesota. The Doherty Family College is a unique program. It's a two-way, two-year, excuse me, two-year pathway to develop the skills students need to ultimately earn a four-year degree. The college currently has 183 students in their first and second years. Not only is the tuition greatly reduced to remove financial barriers to their attendance and their focus on their education, but students are also provided meals, transportation, laptops, and additional support to make sure they realize their full potential and achieve success. A key feature of the college is the internship program, which begins for each student in their second semester. For one day each week, our Doherty Family College students work in local offices as paid members of the staff. This allows them to learn valuable work skills, to understand some of the professional settings out there, whether they're in for-profit, not-for-profit, or governmental organizations, as well as earn money that is important for them in contributing to their families and their education. We're always looking for more organizations of all types to provide internship opportunities for our Doherty Family College students. And if your organization is interested in learning more about this, uh, the leader of our professional internship program is right there. So please see her. And we also have members of our Doherty Family College staff here in attendance as well. So it is now time to hear from the mayor. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Melvin Carter is a fourth generation St. Paul resident. He's a St. Paul public school graduate. He's a former St. Paul City Council member. He's a father, and he's St. Paul's mayor. The mayor grew up in the Rondo neighborhood as the son of one of St. Paul's first black police officers and as the son of a teacher who now serves as a Ramsey County Commissioner. He attended St. Paul Public Schools, ran track at his neighborhood recreation center, graduated from Central High School. He currently lives blocks away from where he grew up 
He currently lives with his wife, Dr. Sakina Futrell Carter, and the youngest three of their five children. Mayor Carter has been working to engage, enfranchise, and uplift people, not only in St. Paul, but across the state and the nation. Most recently, he served as Executive Director of Minnesota Children's Cabinet, advising Governor Mark Dayton on early childhood policy. Prior to joining state government, Mayor Carter represented Ward 1 in the St. Paul City Council from 2008 to 2013. So he's an activist, he's an organizer, he's a leader with a passion, and he's a leader with power, power to bring people together for purpose. He also is a mentor to our students, and I'm very proud to say a friend to me. So please join me in welcoming Mayor Melvin Carter. Good morning. Uh, I am pleased and honored to be here. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And that's really kind. You know, it's one of those moments, like always, you know, you get this kind introduction and you feel like all you can do is go mess everything up. Um, and so I'll try not to. Uh, the morning started with good news, as I heard Dr. Sullivan say uh, that St. Paul is facing two major challenges. Uh, I looked at our folks in the room and went, oh, great, just two. That's one. <laughs> So it's good to start with, uh, with, with the morning with good news. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm a, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts and maybe take a couple of questions. And then uh, we've got some experts here who can clean up everything I mess up uh, after I leave. Uh, so I'm Melvin Carter, and I have the, had the privilege and honor uh, over the past 10 months to serve as mayor uh, in what I truly believe is the most incredible city on the planet, uh, and that's St. Paul, Minnesota. I know that, thank you. I know it's the most incredible city on the planet because St. Paul took a kid like me uh, and helped me just learn and grow and raise me. Uh, I always tell folks that my parents uh, raised me around, you know, they say it takes a whole community to raise a child. Every time somebody says that, I just want to wave my So the question is about organizational change, and, and, and I'm excited about kind of what we're doing in St. Paul. There's a lot of energy in this city, uh, and I think the first thing about what we're doing uh, is our goal is uh, to really uh, tap that energy, to engage that energy, and in some ways just allow it to push us forward in the ways that we haven't before. Uh, I got elected uh, just uh, almost a year ago, uh, and we found ourselves with a very small amount of time uh, to build an, admi an administration uh, and stand up a government that uh, was able to kind of push forward the vision that we have around our city. The first thing is that vision couldn't be just mine. You know, there's that saying that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. I'm always waiting for the third part that says, what if I want to go fast and far? But we know that we need to prioritize going far. And that means we have to go with others. And the great thing is that right now, especially right now in this climate, uh, we have people all over our community who have an energy. Uh, I think there maybe have been times in our country um, where, uh, look at this, this is the first time I've got people on three balconies listening to me. I feel important. <laughs> there may be only be one person up there, but it still counts. It counts. Uh, that people want to be hands-on. People want to help. One of our greatest challenges in this city is I, I go to Target and I go take my children to school and, and people are always saying, how can I help? What can I do? And that's one of our greatest challenges is figuring out how to harness that energy and plug people into our work. And so when we won and when it came time to build this administration, we realized we have to, uh, to hire a cabinet and do all the work to kind of do this transition. And you know, the question, the first question was, who's our transition team gonna be? Uh, and ultimately what that question means is, uh, who are the you know, 12 to 15 people who are the like, most insider of insiders who can have that direct connection with the mayor elect, et cetera? 
and uh, we didn't really like the, the way that question set us up. So instead of kind of going that traditional route, uh, we created a community-based hiring process, which called for over 100 residents of our community, 100 community members, to come together and spend something like three days with us, uh, vetting, you know, reading resumes and vetting candidates and doing the first rounds of interviews. Uh, and sending me slates of candidates who they uh, would suggest that we hire. When we announced that process, one of our local reporters asked, are you concerned this needs 100 people giving up like three days on kind of relatively short notice? Are you concerned that you won't get the people that you need? 300 people signed up and people got mad at us because we didn't have enough seats for all the people who wanted to help and engage. And what excites me is every time we ask people in our city, every time we ask people in our community to help, every time we ask people in our community to do something, uh, they step forward and meet the challenge. That happened during our, our inaugural week when we said, you know what, instead of you know, having some parties and, you know, and, and just have, well, we did have a good party if you were there, we had a good time. <laughs> but instead of just having a party, I'll say, uh, we're gonna do some community service, we're gonna get to know each other better, we're gonna connect with each other, and we're gonna really start to kind of build uh, not just our vision for the city, but the, the, the sort of cross-community relationships that we'll need uh, to build this city forward. The things that we do, uh, everything that we do is around what I think of as like the three, these three, di three dimensions, three degrees of engagement. The first is, you need to hear from me. As your mayor, you need to hear from me. We're not short on that, usually. Um, I get a chance to run my mouth all day, every day. So we get, we, get, we get to cover our base where that first degree is concerned. But the second is I need to hear from you. And we don't really call it feedback. I think of it as direction. You know, we need the direction from our community members. You know what the definition of an expert is, right? Someone from out of town. <laughs> our perspective is that St. Paul has never been short on Harvard expertise. What St. Paul has been short on is the street level expertise that people in all of our neighborhoods could have to offer, could bring to the table to help us figure out how to govern and lead our city forward. I am the first person of color to serve as mayor in a city that is half people of color. I also serve as mayor in a city that laments some of the worst disparities in the nation. We talk about that fact a lot, but here's the point that I'm making is those two things are not coincidental to one another. Uh, in fact, every decision that has ever been made in the history of humankind has been made to benefit the decision makers. And so a core part of why we have to do this three levels of engagement is because even with what my daughters call a woke mayor, <laughs> we need, if, if, if exclusive processes over the past generations that have made decisions about policies and resources without all of the people, all of the communities, all of the voices at the table, if that's what got us into this mess, uh, then more exclusive processes can't get us out of this mess. And so we have to engage people. We have to know that there's a street level expertise that we can take advantage of in our community. And we have to be willing to bring that expertise into our city in a brand new way. Uh, the third level though is we have to hear from each other. So you hear from me, I hear from you, but we have to get to know each other. You know, I've come to the conclusion that I don't care what you tweet or what your position is on Trump's border wall proposal if you never talk to your neighbor, if you never visit a neighborhood over, if you don't ever talk to somebody who doesn't look or act or worship or, you know, talk the same way you do. We have to get to know each other better. That's one of our challenges as a city. The St. Paul we see right now really isn't, the, is, is only geographically the same city I grew up in. Uh, it's changed a lot. And many of our challenges stem from the fact that we haven't taken the time to really get to know each other better. So 
that's how we approach this work, and I'm excited about the way that's playing out. These three dimensions of engagement played out through our uh, through our transition period. They played out through our inauguration week. They played out. You know, one of the first things that we did, we're obviously having a big conversation in our country about the relationship between police officers and community members. And you know, we're the St. Paul Police Department is the only uh, agency, law enforcement agency I know of, uh, that uh, revised completely revised our use of force policies through a two-month-long, two-way conversation with our residents. I don't know of any other law enforcement agency on the planet that's engaged uh, residents in that conversation about what our proper use of force policies should be. They played out when it came time for us to give our state of the city address, uh, which we transformed into a state of our city summit, where instead of just me giving a speech, we invited people to come in and engage with us on all, uh, a whole breadth of different issues. Uh, one of the topics uh, that we had, you know, affordable housing and public safety and minimum wage and all these other things uh, that were really critical. Uh, and one of our staff said, well, we should do one on the city budget. And I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't know about that. I mean, if we have one on you know, public safety and one on you know, affordable housing and one on minimum wage, I mean, are people really gonna go to a budget meeting? Um, and it turned out to be one of our highest energy, highest attended ones. People were really engaged in it. So when it came time for us to build our budget, we did the same thing. We did a set of, uh, a set of uh, events around the city. Uh, and somehow in July, we had a, a series of events where on a, sat on a Saturday or on a Sunday or on a Thursday afternoon, it's 90 degrees outside and we're inside having a beer and talking about the city budget and somehow people were thanking us for it. <laughs> Incidentally, we have some of our budget team in the room who led that process. Thank you guys for your work. Uh, so our goal is to engage people. And through doing that, we've learned a different lens on our city. What we've learned is that too often, the dreams that we dream for our cities, the dreams that we dream for our communities through our children, our dreams for our children, through our businesses, our dreams for our businesses or our dreams for our careers are bigger and bolder than we dare to dream from City Hall. And staying connected with the people who we're here to represent helps us stay connected with that bigger vision. I'm excited about the work that we are doing. We are in the process, uh, President Sullivan, of raising the minimum wage to $15 so that no one who works full time is ever stuck living in poverty. That's important for us as a community, but it's a part of a bigger strategy, right? So another piece that's important to me around organizational change is thinking about what are the questions, getting the questions right. Right now, actually later today, I have a meeting with our snow team. You know, it's gonna snow again this winter. And one of the conversations we've been having over the summer has been why we plow the snow. I've learned that when the mayor asks a question, people get nervous. And so I brought folks into the room and said, why do we plow snow? And they said, Mayor, we have to plow the snow. I said, I know we have to plow the snow. Uh, the question is why? And what we found out is we have a whole bunch of reasons why we plow the snow. And the problem is if we have a whole bunch of reasons why we plow the snow, then we might not know why we plow the snow. So one of the conversations we're gonna have today is getting the question exactly right. So our snow team is putting together three different uh, uh, pr approaches for me. One is what if our goal was uh, to get all of the streets in the city cleared as fast as possible? That could be our goal and there'd be a whole set of strategic decisions that would flow from that. Two is what if our goal was to minimize the impacts of a major snow event on uh, commute time in the morning to work and school. That would be an entirely different strategy that would lead to an entirely different set of strategic decisions. The third would be what if our goal was to minimize accidents and injuries. Those are three different, entirely different goals that would be three different, entirely different approaches uh, to plowing the snow. And I just want to know how we balance those three goals, how we put those three forward, and how we know from one major snow event to the next when we're doing better and when we have things that we need to tweak. So getting those questions right is what really excites me. Public safety is another one. You know, we have people in America and certainly people in St. Paul who feel like, you know, crime is out of control and, you know, we need to do something about it. The first thing I like to remind us is that, you know, violent crime in America has actually been on a decline since its uh, peak in the early 90s. And so some of that is just a propaganda thing. In St. Paul, violent crime is actually down just about 30% year to date, just from last year to this year alone. And so we can maybe, you know, calm down a little bit. But we do owe it to ourselves to think about how our communities can be safer. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we, were, we were promised this tough on crime strategy. You remember that? 
that, that, that ultimately told us, if you hire more police officers and build bigger jails and hire tougher prosecutors to fill them, our neighborhoods will be safer. Is there anyone who would like to take some time at this microphone to argue that that has worked? I didn't think so. So our goal is to say, if our goal is to make our neighborhoods safer, and there are folks who say, well, you know, we have to hire 50 new police officers. And maybe we do. But if our goal is to make our neighborhood safer, and, it's, and if that's important enough for us to say we're going to spend millions of dollars on it, then we ought to think really specifically about what our theory of change around that goal is. Now, one of the things that I've learned is that researchers have a pretty difficult time showing a direct causal relationship between the number of police officers and safety in a community. As a matter of fact, if you look at the, the 100 largest cities in America, the 10 with the highest rates of violent crime per capita hire employ on average almost twice as many police officers as the 10 with the lowest rates of violent crime. Now, I'm not here to argue with you that the police officers create the crime or cause the crime. I'm just here to argue that maybe keeping our neighborhoods safe is more complex than just hiring more police officers. I think that proves that. Now, at the same time, stay with me, uh, we have large bodies of research that show a direct connection between rates of poverty and inequality, between uh, educational attainment and between social cohesion and public safety outcomes. So if we're committed to public safety, then maybe our first strategy isn't to hire 50 new police officers. Maybe our first strategies are to eliminate poverty in our community and make sure everyone has a chance to get a great education and to make sure that we're connected so that we build social cohesion in our communities. <laughs> Getting the questions right is important if we're going to get the answers right. Uh, and that's something that's critical for me. You know, we see a model of leadership, unfortunately, in the White House that prioritizes exclamation points over question marks. But I am convinced that question marks are by far the superior leadership tool. So we're working hard. Uh, we're doing a lot of things. Uh, we're changing our lens on some of everything. Our staff knows that when it comes time for us to really double down and invest deeply and kind of go all in on something, for me it's never going to be because we're doing the same thing we've always done. Uh, I'm convinced that I'm willing to do the things that my grandmother did, but not because my grandmother did them, only because those things have a reason that they're still relevant and they're still current right now. Uh, so this, 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 this immersion that we've had in our community, this immersion we've had in the big vision and the high expectations that people all over our city have for City Hall has really led us to a set of conclusions. Uh, earlier this summer, uh, St. Paul made national news uh, when some uh, new rookie mayor uh, declined to pay $100,000 for a fireworks show on the 4th of July. <laughs> and we had a big conversation about that. And there were folks who said, it's just $100,000. Look, where I'm from, that's still a lot of money. Someone asked me, well, isn't it an equity thing? Because, you know, black children and white children and rich families and poor families and families in Highland and families on the east side can all go and see the fireworks at the same time. And I told them, well, no, no, equity is what happens when you're intentionally eliminating disparities. You know, the fact that this pillar is purple doesn't make it an equity pillar. We were able to not spend that $100,000 in our budget, and coincidentally, we were able to find $100,000 in this year's budget uh, to create a legal defense fund for immigrants and refugees in our community. In the budget proposal, because public safety is so important to us, in our budget proposal that's before our city council right now, uh, we are proposing tripling the amount of free programming in our recreation centers. Uh, we are proposing um, 
uh, historic and unprecedented investments, uh, $71 million over the next three years in affordable housing to make sure that people in our community can live with dignity. Uh, we're proposing embedding mental health uh, co-responders right with our police officers so when we find people in crisis, we can bridge them to the resources and the support and the help that they need. And one of my favorite things that we're doing, it's a brand new kind of approach to city government. One of my favorite things that we're doing is we announced just a couple of months ago uh, uh, that we have taken the step in St. Paul to eliminate late fees in our St. Paul Public Library. When we did that, um, the internet kind of went crazy. One of the great parts about being mayor is if you don't know what to do about something, there's always a lot of advice on Twitter. The internet went crazy and they said, well, what about personal responsibility? This is an attack on personal responsibility. How will our children learn personal responsibility without late fees? It's a real thing. It's a real concern. It's almost as scary as not having fireworks on the 4th of July. Uh, look, um, the, um, the, my, my, I, I like reading the tweets. My wife always tells me not to read the tweets uh, or the comments on the papers. My, my second favorite one happened around late fees. Somebody tweeted, uh, I'm sorry, my second favorite one happened around, um, around uh, the, the fireworks. Somebody tweeted, uh, clearly he would have been on the British side. <laughs> Which I feel like escalated very quickly. <laughs> My response to that one is I'd have been on the side of freedom, which is complicated. Um, my favorite one actually came after we eliminated late fees. Somebody was so concerned about late fees, they posted on Facebook that uh, next St. Paul will be like that movie, the, the Purge, where once a week it's legal to kill people. I was like, right, because that's the next step after eliminating late fees. <laughs> But people are concerned about that. Like, how are our children going to learn personal responsibility? I have a perfect answer, too. They can check out a library book. <laughs> we have books about personal responsibility. Look, look, late fees in our libraries don't make people bring books back. They make uh, people stay away from the library. We have 51,000 library cards right now. Uh, deactivated in St. Paul for as little as $10 in late fees going back to 2009. That's disgusting. Somebody who's been active in our library system for the last 20 years uh, looked at that and said, wow, that's so obvious and it's so incredible. And I feel guilty that I never thought that we, we should have done that a long time ago. But that's what I'm talking about. You know, if an expert is someone from out of town, then you'll never figure that out. And here's why. People on one side of town don't turn books back in later uh, than people on another side of town. But for some families, a $12 late fee means a different decision about what we can have for dinner tonight. And if we run our libraries in a way that never engages those families, we won't know that. We won't have the opportunity to change. We won't have the opportunity to build a library that works for them. You know, we talk all the time about building a city that works for all of us. And that's something that is important to me, very important to me. And all I'm saying is that if we're gonna build a city that works for all of us, the only way to do that is to give all of us a chance to build. Thank you very much. Want to take a question? Want to take a question? Okay. Thank you very much. Did I go too long? So it's so difficult to go after the mayor um, and our maybe boring presentation now <laughs> about data and all of that. He's basically summed up everything that we're going to put in the presentation. So bye. Um, no. My name is Tony Newborn. I serve as the Chief Equity Officer, and I'm really honored to, to serve with Andrea Turner and work with Scott Hammond, my fe fellow presenters here today, as well as with the mayor um, on this presentation. And as a side note, a lot of people ask me, um, how is it working for the mayor? I mean, is it just as exciting? And I'm like, with what you see here and who he, how he presents himself in, in every situation, it's who he is. And so we're having fun. 
and we put, I put on my running shoes because I have to keep up with him. He was trained in track, and so we all have to run <laughs> with the mayor. So we're having a great time, and it's a great uh, time to be in the city of St. Paul and working for the city of St. Paul. So it's an honor. We're here today to talk about um, the blueprint for organizational change. And the mayor's outlined so many things that we have been, been working on, and there's just so much more for us to, to do. But the focus of this presentation is going to be from, from our human resources standpoint, our workforce data, our workforce uh, information and, and policies and procedures that we have in place. And so you'll hear from myself, you'll hear from Andrea Turner, who's our HR director, and hear from Scott Hammond, who uh, was a consultant that we worked with and I, who I called when I was working in HR, my best friend, for six months because we worked together for six months and he helped me do all of these things that were in my mind that I wanted to see happen on paper and put them in, uh, into something that I could read and understand. So you'll hear from us in talking about that today. And then feel free, we'll have some time at the end to, to answer any questions um, that you may have uh, about the work that we've been doing. And please note that you know we haven't arrived you know, with the city, though we are the presenters, there's still work for us to do, and what the mayor talked about, the, the gaps that we need to fill, the disparities that are still prevalent in, in our city and across the state. But um, with under his leadership, we've, we've got a good format um, going, and under Andrea's leadership, we have a good structure in place to really move forward. So you heard from the mayor. Um, some topics and objectives that we're going to talk about today. We'll, you'll hear from us about our diversity framework, um, our equity framework that we put in place. We'll talk a little bit about retention. We'll talk about our community engagement um, and, and community participatory input uh, process. And the mayor highlighted quite a few of those things that we've done. But some of our departments are doing some additional work as well. We'll end the conversation around best practices. And you'll hear from uh, the three of us and, and, and our perspectives on that. And then hopefully we'll have some time for, for Q&A as well. So a little bit about St. Paul. The mayor gave such a great um, introduction into this great city, but we're um, comprised of a population of almost 300,000 folks. Um, as far as our 60% um, uh, of our uh, residents are white, persons of color is 39.9%. Our workforce is a little under 3,000 employees. It's 3,000 employees uh, with our full-time and part-time workforce. 73% um, of our workforce is white and the 27% of our workforce is persons of color. 30% of our workforce is women. Our blueprint um, for today's discussion and kind of where we have formatted and structured our work as it relates to how do we diversify our workforce with persons of color and women and veterans and persons with disabilities um, started with and, and, and kind of formed with our developing our equity framework and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then moving to, okay, now that we we're looking through a lens of equity, um, how do we attract persons of color and women into our workforce. So developing that talent acquisition plan or that recruitment plan. And so we created a framework around that, so you'll hear from us about that. Um, developing a retention framework. And oftentimes for those HR professionals that are in the room, you often say that you should start with retention um, first and then move into recruitment. And it depends on your organization, obviously, but we'll talk a little bit about that. But I think our equity framework and building that had a lot to do with how we're, we're taking care of home business first and, and then um, being able to retain folks and then uh, putting ourselves in a position to where we could attract um, individuals of color and women into our workforce. And then we, we'll talk a bit at the end about our community engagement framework. And as the mayor said, taking direction from the community. We often, you hear it often said as, oh, we're, we're seeking feedback. Feedback tends to be a one-sided conversation. Um, direction is, I want you to do this. And we're in the process now of holding voices of our community input sessions in St. Paul. And we're asking folks, tell us how we're doing. Do you like it? Do you not like it? What can we be doing better? And I can tell you, for those of you all who are residents of St. Paul, um, we talk about, the mayor talked about minimum wage, we talked about college savings accounts, we've talked about public safety and gun control, but one of the hottest topics is organized trash. 
and we get a lot of people heated discussions about trash in our city. And so we've gotten a lot of direction, to use the mayor's uh, terminology, about trash. And so, um, but it's, it's important for people to be able to have that platform and opportunity and for the mayor to hear and for our leadership to hear what folks have to say about this, this new initiative. And so we'll talk about that as well. As far as our equity framework, we started about four years ago with an organization uh, called the Government Alliance on Racial Equity, GARE. How many of you all have heard about GARE? I see some hands raised in the room. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about GARE, but if, if for those of you all who don't know about it, come and talk to me afterwards. It's a long discussion that we don't have time for. It. But um, GARE has been instrumental in helping uh, cities across, uh, city states and other jurisdictions across the country to develop what's called a racial equity initiative, a racial equity framework. And it's basically um, focusing on and lifting up race to uh, change our policies and procedures to ensure that there is a lens in which we look through our work. And so when we talk about equity, you know, we merge diversity and inclusion, we use all of these words interchangeably, but we see equity as a lens in which we view our work. Um, are we meeting people where they're at in order for them to be successful? We're not saying one group get, gets to be successful or the, over the other. All of us, in order for us to build a St. Paul that works for all of us, we need to look through a lens and, and approach our work in that same way. And so within that equity framework, and what I call our ecosystem, our mayor's office is, is involved, our mayor is involved, our deputy mayor is involved with this, our city council is a part of this. We have 14 operating departments, and each of those departments have what we call an equity change team or an action team. And that group is assigned um, to look through um, their work through that equity lens and view and create a strategic plan um, in which they're lifting up priorities and initiatives in their particular department in which they're saying, hey, we see there's some potential inequities here in our policies and procedures and, and or our outcomes or in our services that we want to remedy. And what are the steps that we are going to take in order to do that? And so um, our departments are tasked with creating a plan and submitting that to to myself and to folks in the mayor's office and the goal is to reach to achieve those um, those goals by the end of the year we also offer trainings so we have our anti-racism training we have our foundations on racial equity training and other opportunities for our departments to talk about race to talk about gender talk about the intersectionality between race and gender that's happening both internally in our workforce, but also, again, within those policies and procedures and the outcomes and the experiences that our residents have through our services. Um, we have a, an executive leadership team, and which is comprised of departments, and their, their role is to, to ensure that we're looking from an administration-wide viewpoint and ensuring that our policies and procedures are in place and that we're, there's a, a, method or a, me a method of accountability that's in place for our departments. Um, again, I mentioned the, the trainer, trainings, and the change teams meet on a quarterly basis. And so we do that to give our, our employees an opportunity to talk about, hey, what's going on across departments? And for those of you all who work in large organizations, it's very easy to do your work in silos. So, oh, public works is over here. We don't know what's going on in HR. I don't want to know what's, what police and fire are doing because I'm in my swim lane in, in our budget office. And so this is an opportunity for us to cross-pollinate in, in, in a certain uh, aspect, work together, highlight and lift up issues that are going on in, in our department, and figure out ways in working with our HR department, how can we remedy these issues, how can we um, resolve the issues and be a city um, that works cohesively together so that we can better serve our residents. Because at the end of the day, that's why we're here. We're public servants. We're here to provide a service to our residents. And I'm a firm believer, I'm from the South, and my mom always said, take care of home business first before you start telling other people what they they should be doing. And so part of this equity work has been just that, is taking care of home business, making sure that we can keep, uh, as we're trying to attract uh, individuals of color and women, that our policies and procedures, our structure, and our work environment is inclusive so that folks will stay and be happy to, to, to be at work. 
We spend, uh, I spend too much time at work. <laughs> I spend more time at work than I do um, with my husband and friends and families, and I'm sure you all do as well. And so it at least needs to be a happy place. <laughs> it, it at least needs to be a place where I can spend those eight plus hours a day, or it should be. Um, and so our job uh, within, the, within the leadership and working with the mayor is to create that environment so that you, you don't feel like you're working past eight hours. This is just a part of your everyday work and you're enjoying it. So that's our equity framework. Um, some of the tools that we've used is, and if you are familiar with Garrett, this all on their website. We copied and pasted is the kind of beauty of working for government. Um, you can copy and paste things because everything is public. And what Garrett has been able to offer are some tools that we have been able to use to help um, our departments move forward in the direction that we want them to as it relates to looking to, through that equity lens and serving our community. So we have tools such as uh, an equity assessment. These, uh, this tool is asking questions around, okay, what policy and procedure are you trying to change? Do you, have you ran any data? Do we actually do some research into this particular issue? Have we ran some data around this? Who is this impacting? And is it in a positive and or negative way? And what steps are you going to take to make those particular changes? I mentioned that we have those work plans. The work plans are a strategic uh, planning tool in which we're able to track and hold ourselves accountable for our goals, strategic objectives, and establishing deadlines to meet those goals. Um, we have um, staff trainers, so we adopt the train the trainer model. So some of our trainings that are conducted by our HR department are, are um, facilitated by our own staff. So we train our staff to be better facilitators and to conduct uh, the trainings on either our new employee orientation, um, our upstander versus bystander training, um, our foundations on racial equity training, et cetera. And then I'm so glad to see our budget team in the back because one of the things around uh, this equity work that we're trying to change and adopt is that, you know, there's one thing to talk about, oh, I have this great initiative and this great goal and plan. It is our diversity, inclusion, equity initiative. I'm going to get this done by the end of 2018. But if you don't have any money to do that, then that poses a problem. And so um, one of the things that we're working on right now is gender neutral bathrooms. And I thought, you know, me being naive that, oh, this is going to be easy. We just changed little signs around the, the city. And now we have gender neutral bathrooms. How nice. Well, you all are laughing because you probably know that it's more challenging than that. There's building codes. There's legal stuff. There's uh, is this building built before 1920, whatever, whatever, or is it after? Um, the code for the state still says water closets, so that our codes are, are uh, antiquated. So how do you match that up with gender neutral bathrooms, which is a very modern uh, 2018 term? So it's a little bit more difficult th than that. But we formed a work group around uh, gender neutral bathrooms, and I started asking people, do you have the money to either change the sign or revamp your bathrooms so that it meets the building goals? Yes, no, maybe, maybe in five years we'll do that. And so, um, but you have to have the funding to be able to do that, and we have to start thinking strategic around if you want, it. there's one thing to have a change team to put forth initiatives and create goals, but if your leadership and the folks who control the budget are not aligned as to whether you can get that done, then these initiatives are not going to take place. And with the gender neutral bathrooms, it's not going to take place until folks put some money on the table to be able to do that. And so our budget uh, process, and ma the mayor talked about uh, that, needs to be aligned as a relates to our, our overall framework and is specifically with equity. So the next aspect of our uh, blueprint, and I'm going to call our, my best friend, um, Scott Hammond, to the podium to talk about how he helped us to build our diversity recruitment uh, plan. And starting from a standpoint, and, and I'll add this, maybe Scott can add this because we had to pay him, but um, we, our data was everywhere. There was a system for this, and then there was a system, a database for that, and then there was like four of the systems, and none of them talked. And so when I started working with Scott, I'm like, can you help me do where, can you help me figure out these systems? He was like, no, but if you send me the data, then I can help you figure out uh, some, some form of a plan. And so that's why he's been my best friend, um, to, because he's helped us start out from a place where our staff was doing a, a good job and kind of gathering the data, but he was able to put a, a smooth touch on it to where we could read it and be able to use it as a communication tool. So I want to invite Scott up to talk.
so as, as Tony spoke, um, uh, so first of all, I hope I'm now a friend of the city and not an external um, person from the other side of the um, other side of the river. But um, so really what, again, I think the exciting piece was, um, as Tony mentioned, is the city of St. Paul had a lot of data, and, I, and many of you may, may feel the same way, and I know I have in my career, is we have a lot of data and we have a lot of information, but we're not quite sure what to do with it or what does that mean. So um, in terms of perspective of today, I think my, my role is probably the least exciting piece of what we might talk about, but it's really taking data, knowing what it is, um, and I do like the mayor's comment of um, and, and asking the questions of what, uh, and, and as opposed to just jumping to the end and saying, now we have all this information and we have all the answers, it's really saying, okay, we have all this information, what are the questions and what, is, uh, what are we trying to work on here? So <clears throat> we took data, uh, really wanting to understand what that meant, um, and also establishing goals. I think the other uh, sort of connection point is, is here is there's a lot of information, and again, I've been guilty of this, and, and now I want to take these 10 things and do them all at one time. Um, and I think as, as I've worked in my career, that doesn't actually uh, work that well. So really establishing those preliminary goals and prioritizing what that meant. Um, and then uh, again, my, the work I've done. So I, we implemented and really worked on a multi-phased project. Uh, so we looked, uh, when I was asked to come in, we looked at the current workforce and what are the employee demographics and how does that compare to uh, the city uh, of St. Paul um, what are the turnover trends? So one of the things is looking at uh, past data in order to look at how can we predict and look at what's gonna, what could be, could be happening in the next several years. Um, and um, as we kept talking, uh, we kept looking out farther and further. So I think initially we were looking at the two or three years of data and then we uh, built and said, gosh, can we look through 2021 and say, uh, with our retirement projections, with our turnover data, can we, can we identify where we might have some opportunity for city employees and where they might be either retiring or having some turnover? Um, we looked at that again compared to workforce availability. We established some recommendations based on data and then ultimately developed and implemented those, those strategies for identified roles. So what you will see in here is um, a lot of information. Um, we won't, I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through the details, but know that that's how we got to where we are. Uh, but we did look at demographics. We looked at gender. We looked at race. Uh, we took uh, some time and looked at the age and generations in the workforce because I think as, um, as a city, you have um, at least four, if not five, different generations working in the uh, side by side with each other. And what does that mean in terms of, um, of the workforce? And then also availability and that utilization rate. So um, one of the other data cuts we looked at was the turnover piece. Again, similar um, data pieces, but we also looked between full-time and part-time staff because as, we, as I talked with the city, there became some differences between what's happening with full-time and part-time workforce. And again, it's just one other way to kind of look at this and say, are there different aspects that we need to address? Um, and then we looked at the four largest, uh, largest departments of the workforce because that was 65 or is 65% of the, the city's workforce. So police, fire, parks, and public works. Um, again, turnover in 2017, it's actually, it was relatively low in terms of some comparisons, about 7.7% of full-time employees. Um, but then again, the chem as we all know though, that number again historically has been increasing. So that's, that's one data point to look at. Um, and we did look at that because the part-time staff was about 19% in their workforce. And again, as we sort of uncovered some pieces, that may make some sense given there's uh, some seasonal work, there's, there's jobs that turn over more regularly in the part-time uh, workforce, and so it's just one other piece of information to look through. Um, the aging workforce is one that we took a look at, um, and then turnover other than just retirement. So what were the other reasons that people were choosing to leave uh, the city? And the, the last point, as we all know, the available workforce itself, it certainly isn't growing. Um, and so what do we do both short term and long term to put some focus into place, um, both on the recruitment and retention side? Again, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time uh, going through the details of this, but we looked at uh, demographics based on um, uh, of, of, of races and gender um, and looked at those um, four largest departments along with the total workforce and then that bottom one is what where we compared to the the St. Paul workforce or the St. Paul general population. So we looked at uh, that data set, uh, we looked at the again the um, ages and generations in the workforce 
And so the interesting part of the city of St. Paul is you know, one of the things we were able to do was to say we can actually predict some retirement turnover based on how the city has established uh, different guidelines. And so with an average age of, let's say, 44, 44.6, we can start to see um, where those projections might end up and how we can use that data to make some plans. Um, Tony talked about this one a bit. Uh, I think, but we did some comparison by race of, of uh, turnover data, so we can see employ, uh, employees of color slightly higher than um, our, the white counterparts. Same with gender, female actually about double um, the turnover rate of male. So that was another piece where we said, is there something that we want to pay attention to in there? Uh, let's see, we looked through job classifications, and we also looked at it by a department level. This one's really busy. Um, but we were able to go in and say, okay, what was happening with turnover co by comparison of race for our full-time employees by department? And we actually broke that down um, further into job classifications. Um, I thought we had one on, let's see, gender, maybe we don't. Um, but really, in summary, again, a lot of information, but it was the, the data was showing that we had a slightly higher turnover rate for both women and people of color compared to the total workforce. Um, so we wanted to monitor that. We wanted to look for any systemic issues that were happening. Again, the part-time workforce was higher than in full-time. Um, but again, that may, be, that may have been uh, expected based on the duration of the work. And we also looked at um, the EEO job groups and, and looked for where does that utilize, utilization activity um, based on availability uh, within the city of St. Paul. This is the one I think of um, to spend just a little bit of time on. This is where we got much more focused on pre the predictive side of the uh, equation. And so again, on the, uh, the one side of the equation, we looked at it by department and we actually broke that down and went into different job classifications. But this is where we started to spend some time saying, we have uh, individuals who are going to be retiring over the next three, four, five years. Um, and that might be the opportunity where we spend some time saying, what are our recruitment efforts? Where do we focus our attention into those job classifications? Where do we uh, maybe do recruitment in a different way, but also where do we spend some time doing the development side of it? And um, because this might mean we have to establish different relationships with schools or partnerships or other agencies to help um, fill in some of these roles. So again, this is a high level summary of it. But we then took all that data, forecasted it out, and you can see, obviously, through 2021, the turnover rate just uh, based on retirements alone continues to go up. And so this isn't, um, as a former recruiter, this isn't one to, <laughs> to make me go, gosh, now I have just even more to do to fill these potential 500 vacancies in a year, but rather how do we partner on that in advance? And that was part of the, uh, really part of the initial work was to say, okay, we know this is coming. Let's not wait until 2021 to work on it. Let's start de developing those plans and implementing them now to, to meet those needs. And then we developed some recommendations from a talent side. Again, uh, the goal is to seek and attract high and higher diverse talent. Um, what were our uh, implementation plans to increase the number of candidates from diverse backgrounds? So again, um, I think uh, to keep doing this, the things the same way wasn't necessarily going to be the answer, but where were those best practices? What was working? And where could we make some suggested changes, um, both, again, in the short term as well as more long-term sourcing strategies? Um, Tony talked about this a bit, and, as did the mayor, but working with key schools or agencies or where were our job training partnerships that we could um, rely on and build that relationship. I think one of the, the one of the pieces we talked about as well was having those inter, internal diversity champions, or I believe the city calls them ambassadors, really to support that work and be that uh, spokesperson and be that relationship builder across the across the city, and other other opportunities to focus and provide uh, some partnership and relationships across the, the Twin Cities. This one yours. Andrea. I'm going to turn it over to Andrea now to talk about implementation. Good morning. Just trying to wake myself up even more than I already am. So it's a pleasure to be here this morning with you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about implementation. I'm going to talk about some things that we're doing. And then I'm going to give some practical advice. You know, every time you go 
to a session, you're like, give me some meat that I can actually start to chew on, right? We're all hungering for that. And so we hope to be able to provide that to you today as well. So then we get into implementation. So we develop a recruitment plan, establish a strategy, and a set of goals. And we focus on improving the candidate experience. A lot of times we don't think about things like that. We think we'll throw the job out there and people will come. You know, that's a, that's a part of the government mindset. Everybody wants to line up and work for us. Not so true. And we've got to think about how our structure has been built to actually keep people out. And that's a hard thing to come up and say because these are structures that we've had in place forever. But they're structures in place that are not helpful as we move forward 2018 and beyond. So we focused on improving what happens when that job is put out there. We want to increase the visibility of the city's hiring process. So we went out and created Elevate Sessions. These are sessions that talk about the city and working for the city and what's the process like. So we want to make sure we're kind of getting our name out, establishing a brand, if you will, and getting people familiar with the process so it's a lot less intimidating when they get to it. And that's a critical factor when you're trying to break down barriers that you're not even sure are there. But they are there when people are applying. How many of you have ever looked at a process that you were about to get into and said, oh my God, it'll take me weeks to apply for this job? Not worth it. People move on. And so we have to think about what we're doing. And then we're also um, presenting that data to directors so that they understand what's going on inside their departments when we're trying to recruit and with their effort as well. And then we track promotional data. So we get people inside the organization. Now let's see what's happening once they get in. Because a lot of organizations say, we brought them, and they don't track beyond that. What's the experience once you get into an organization? What are your opportunities for growth and development? And that also requires that we take a look at our practices and policies inside the organization. How do we promote? The city is, uh, has 25 unions, so those are our partners as well in this work. Sometimes we use the word partnership, sometimes we don't. But the reality is they are our partners in this work and we have to help them understand why change is critical. For their interest to go on as well as ours to survive and serve the city. So we have to pay very close attention to what we're doing and recognize we have to work in tandem in order to work through some of the challenges that we have. I'm great with technology. So the diversity and recruitment plan is a goal of 24% for people of color. So we analyze the workforce. We take a look at what we're actually doing where our opportunities lie, and what is that pipeline that can be used to help increase our diversity hiring, people of color in particular, in this area. And the city has been working on this over the last four plus years. So we have to increase our awareness about positions. We have to make sure that people know what kind of positions are out there. And you can't really start recruiting too early, you know, as we begin to talk about kinds of opportunities and career growth and paths that people are able to take. We want to make sure that they're aware of the kinds of opportunities that the city has. And then remove barriers uh, to employment. 
And we have several pipeline programs that we do have. So it's an entry, entry, very entry level way of getting into the city and then moving forward into other career opportunities. We have a few. We want to have more. We want to give individuals an opportunity who might not have all the skill sets that are needed, but we can partner with other community groups in order to help open those doors for people. So quarter one in 2018, we've got uh, the workforce by race. And as you can see, that's the breakdown. We're still not where we want to be. There are areas that are very small that we need to beef up. And what's our effort around Native Americans? What's our effort around Hispanic? We need to pay attention to what we're doing and start to make more efforts around targeted recruitment. Now, people always get their knickers in a twist when we talk about targeted recruitment. Because they're like, well, what about everybody else? I said targeted recruitment. What is recruitment? It's letting people know the positions are there and getting them engaged and interested in possibly applying and working. Getting that pool as full and as rich as you possibly can, making that a great experience for candidates. So even if I didn't get that job, I'm still interested in you all. I'm coming. I'm going to find another position that works for me, and I'm going to apply to that one. And I'm going to tell my friends about that. And I'm going to tell my family members. Because what happens is bad news travels like lightning. I had an awful experience. They suck. They just, oh, is this on film? They, they suck. And um, it was not a good experience. Don't apply there. Because I think it says something about the organization. And we have to make sure that what we talk about inside and what we talk about as we reflect out lines up. Because when they don't line up, you have a problem. And no effort in the world will undo it. So this is our percentage of workforce by gender. Again, 30 and 70, approximately. Still not where we want to be. And remember earlier, we talked about tracking people leaving. So we said we want to make it a good experience. We want to see how people are promoted. We also want to see what's happening when people are leaving. You know, retirement is great. We know that those days come. But when people make a decision, and we also want to look at the window, this is where data can be helpful, and you have to be open and willing to drill down on the data, because I'm not just interested in how many women and how many people of color are leaving. I'm interested in how soon after they started here are they leaving, what departments are they leaving, what units in the departments are they running from, and what's going on. I sat down with the HR liaisons. We have HR liaisons in all of our departments. And they're connected to central HR, but they're employees who are housed in the different departments. I talked about stay interviews. And government doesn't talk about stay interviews very much. Because we got the unions. And the unions don't want you to treat anybody different. Everybody's the same. Well, everybody's not the same. That's the whole point of this. Everybody's not the same. So when I do performance reviews and I'm engaging with an employee, I want to make sure that I get a sense of where they are and how they're feeling about their work. Again, the experience when you're applying and what's happening when you're inside the organization. Does anybody care about you? Do they care about your development? Do they care about the things you're struggling with? Or are you just a number? And we can replace you at will. Okay. 
So we talked about our full time and our part time. I'm not going to spend much time uh, on that. Um, so we talked about improving the candidate experience. The process with the city of St. Paul was significantly slow. It would take months and months before we could get you from application to in the door. And then when you finish the HR portion of the process and then you go out to the department, because they haven't hired yet, we're just getting prepped for them to go. And that includes taking the, a test, which we no longer call a test anymore. We call it an assessment. You know, words are important. A lot of times we, we don't think they're as important as they really are. But I'm not sure I want to take a test to get a job. I've had enough tests in my educational career. You're now assessing me to determine whether or not I can work for you or work in this particular role. So we eliminated the word test. We also took a look at all the pieces that were dragging our process down. We talked earlier about technology, and I, I still have one other technology piece, and I'm going to bring it up as I talk about onboarding. So what we did was we took a look at all the processes that go on in HR from the moment we post a position all the way up to the moment we release the list of applicants to the hiring department. And we were able to shorten that by addressing some of the processes that we have in place that were useless, not helpful, delaying of time. And our next layer is to now work with departments on reducing their time. Because this, this is an effort that we both have to partner in. And we have to make sure that we are not doing one thing on one end and not addressing the other side as well. So our goal is to continue to shorten this time frame. So we talked about removing the word exam. We also took a look at the questions we ask around racial diversity and equity. You know, asking someone, do you believe in it? Well, what do you think they're going to say? Yeah. That doesn't tell you anything about how they approach it, what it means to them in their work. So we made changes to that profile of questions that we ask around this to give meaning to their answers so that you can make an assessment in the interview process. We changed the transcript policy. You used to have to have your transcript before we'd even give you full consideration. You had to have that with the application. How many of you have tried to track down a transcript? It's not just poof, I have 500 of them sitting in my drawer at home. You gotta call the school. Maybe if you've made a donation, you might get it quicker. <laughs> Beyond your school loans. But it's a barrier. You can get it later. There's another way in the process to get that. Why would you have individuals go through this hoop and they're not even guaranteed an interview at this point? This is just for you to check off that their application is complete. Think about the hoops that you have individuals going through in your process. So I talked about the Elevate sessions. So when the city started, you know, they've had a total of 34 events, and we've had over 477 participants. So we go all over the, all over the St. Paul. We pick times where people are available. We don't say, hey, come see us at 10 o'clock in the morning. We come in the evenings. We come to the libraries. We come, you know, to Wilder. We come to different places, the Widener Center. We come to different places out in the community so people see us. When you're talking about meeting your community and going where they are and then doing it makes a significant difference. And we gather information from uh, those folks 
when they have gone through the process of how we can do those Elevate sessions even better. We've used uh, technology and social media to broaden our presence. And remember, Scott talked about five, six generations in the workplace. You've got to reach out to all of them. You've got to figure out what mechanism you need to use, mechanisms you need to use to reach as many people as you possibly can. Because that's going to be critical. And we have increased and broadened our reach. So in 2010, we had about, you know, on average 67 subscribers. Uh, the end of 2017, we're well over 4,000. So something is happening. You know, we go to schools. We, we, we do different things to try to make a connection in the community we serve. So I said earlier, we take a look at promotions. You know, every organization has back doors. And it's the back doors that are just as problematic as barriers, because they're pretty slick. We all, most of us know what the back doors are, and we can slide people through. We want to remove the back doors as well. I'm going to get my friends promoted. My friends happen to look like me. And so we have to call out all of our behavior that's problematic and be open to doing so, so that we do have a process that is open. Just as the front door is open to getting in, the process for development and growth must be open in an organization. Or again, you betray what you purport to be. So you have to make decisions about who you are and that shared and common vision that you have for yourself. You are looking at it through an equity lens. You're looking at it through fairness. You're looking at it from every perspective and saying, who is excluded in this process? So the city went through a hiring process for its directors. I was, was privileged to go through the process because I was shocked that government could move that fast and saw, oh, so it is possible when we set our mind to it and uh, was selected. And I'm, I'm very privileged to have gone through a process so unique and different in government. And so it opened the door for more females at the director level than the city has ever seen. Well, that's great. You have a little more latitude over that particular process. And it's not as uh, restricted as some of the other processes. But now when you get into promotions within the organization, how do we talk about those opportunities? You know, time served is progression and a line. You'll get an increase there. But a promotional opportunity into a completely different role, how do we talk about those? How do we promote those? Because by the time they're known, the person's already selected. So just like we promote jobs that we have open, how are we talking about promotion and growth? How are we doing that from a performance management standpoint? How are we doing that from a transparency standpoint? Not only transparency across the city, but transparency even within a department. You'll hear people say, I didn't know that position was open. Well, you didn't know because they reorganized Monday and they put the person in on Friday. How would you know? And so we have to address that uh, as well. 
Thank you. I'll come back. We were playing a game of no, you talk, no, no, you talk. Um, Andrea is great. I love Andrea. Um, I love that, that she's here um, with the city. And um, one thing, Andrea, is uh, when I was working in HR and before she arrived, I had difficulty with um, getting people, the director and, and the leadership, to say no. Like, no, you can't do that. Stop doing that. And Andrea says no all the time. And it's, it's, it's a good thing. And she's an attorney. And she says, no, we're not going to do that because there's a better way to look at it at this, or there's a more equitable way to look at this, or you're not going to hook up your friend in, in this particular situation. So I love that she's here and that she says no to folks. We're going to zip through the retention piece because we want to get have some time for you all to ask questions. Um, I, hopefully it works. This is our, our menu of, uh, of retention practices. And more, a couple of things, not to, to take anything from what Andrea is going to say, is um, Retention, and it depends on whether you want to start with the retention first or your recruitment practices first. And there's studies out there that talk about whether you, which one you should do. But it all depends on your organization. But how you bring people in and welcome them into your work environment is key. With a smile on your face, how about that? And talking about how great it is to work for the city and then giving people stuff for them to read and be able to uh, start them on a good path towards their employment, having the computers on, the passwords checked in. And I, I know this sounds very elementary, but it doesn't happen a lot of times. You start people in, there's papers flying everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, go downstairs and get your badge and ID, and you do that, and we'll come back in 10 minutes and take you to lunch. Hooray. You started with the city of St. Paul. That's not on onboarding. And so putting, being strategic around your onboarding practices. Um, Andrea talked about stay interviews. That's a key part. That's a part of the onboarding piece as well. There's studies that show you know, within the first 90 days or even shorter um, that you should have those check-in with your employees to find out, hey, do you like it? Because they'll know by then whether they like you or not. Um, and so asking them the question, how is it going? Um, and tell me what I can do to support you is key. Having Andrea talked about how with the community hiring process that we have a new wave of, of directors, new and old, a mixture, but a good balance from a diversity standpoint, that's key. And then giving them the tools to be able to supervise. Just because you grew up in the city from you know, age 12 to now you're, you're the director of some department or a manager doesn't mean you're a good manager because you have the title. What tools are we putting into place? What training are we providing to, make, uh, to help you be successful? What do you know the definition, working definition of equity? Do you understand diversity and inclusion? And it doesn't mean just hiring black people into your organization. What does that mean? Do you have an understanding of that? So our HR department is tasked, as well as with our uh, internal departments, is tasked with making sure that we have, uh, we're building up our, our leaders as well. And then we offer some trainings called the Inclusive work, um, Workforce Training, in which it's for our supervisors and managers to come in and talk about what does it mean to, be, to develop an inclusive workforce build out your onboarding um, uh, plan, build out how do you hire people, and, and uh, interviewing as a skill. A lot of people don't think that that's a skill, but it is. Your job is not just to ask questions. Your job is to help evaluate, assess, and do it from and, and through that equity lens, which also includes not being biased. And so and understanding what your biases are. And that's a skill that you need to develop. So we provide training to do that. Talk to our employees about our benefit program. Um, the benefit of working for government is our benefits. Pension, we have that. Do your employees know about that? And given this, you know, this may be my quasi-political statement for today, but given our um, current administration, the Public uh, uh, Service Loan Forgiveness Program, I'm signed up, hopefully it will happen, because I'm still paying those loans back to William Mitchell College of Law. And so, um, do our employees know about our benefit packages and some of the benefits of working for government? Some of our recruitment initiatives, Andrea talked about the STAY interview the, that's in progress right now in developing that. We have employee resource networks. We have a women's employee resource network. We have an LGBTQ employee resource network. And we have a runner's group 
uh, as well. Um, we have an exit interview process, and then I mentioned the, the inclusive workforce training, and we also have a new, um, a new employee orientation, which is offered on a quarterly basis. In addition to the blueprint, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, with this just because the mayor did. Hope it goes. There it is. Okay. Our participatory input framework. This is key, and this has been life changing for, for us and this current administration. We are doing community engagement everywhere. If you follow us on Facebook or follow the mayor, we are running around the city asking people for directions. And that's in essence what we're doing. We're asking them to tell us where should we be going left, right, around in a circle, or up and down, and what's specifically going on in your area. And this slide just shows just a snapshot of the work that we're doing. Some best practices, and I'm just going to zip through some of these. And please take, and we put a lot of time, we were up to midnight last night putting together these best practices. So read every bullet point that I have in here. Um, but best practices from a consultant standpoint. I mentioned Scott being our, my, my best friend, and he can be your best friend too if you talk to him. <laughs> and so read his uh, bio to find out where he works at Verseek. He can be your best friend too. And the consultant coming in, the benefit of it, at least initially, is that he's not caught up in all the drama of HR and the drama of your office, right? He's assigned to come in, look at your work and say, do this, that, do this and that, make these recommendations, let me know how it works. And that's great, but that's maybe not sustainable for your organization to continue to pay, but at least he can set you up to where if he can teach you how to fish, it's, it'll, <laughs> the wars will be plentiful. Um, and so look, take a look at the, the best practices from a consultant and keep in mind he's coming in external from the organization and that can be a benefit. Our best practice from the, the HR director, she, uh, Andrea talked about building partnership, having a shared vision. Um, that, and then for those of you all who are into strategic planning and business plans and all of that and get geeked out about doing that every year, great. It's, it's important. I know, I, I have an, a great understanding of the mayor's direction because he's told me and I have, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I have bought into the vision that the mayor has set forth for us. And that's important. So any event that I go to, whether the mayor is speaking or not, I'm saying the same thing that he's saying. Um, and that's important so that you know where you're headed and that you feel committed um, to the organization. And again, establishing the two-way uh, communication strategy. So whether that's internally within your organization, with your employees, but that's also working with the community members as well. And evaluate. So it's one thing, you know, it's great. We, we put together an Elevate session. Hooray. Do people like it? I don't know. Maybe we just go all around running around and doing Elevate sessions. We have an evaluation component to it. And people tell us, hey, I like this continue to do it, here are some opportunities for improvement. So making sure that you're evaluating your services, evaluating the initiatives that you have as well. And identify and celebrate milestones. It's important to do that because people like to be recognized. That helps them to continue to do the work if you give them a smiley face, and I do literally mean smiley face. Smiley face or two stars like what you got when you were in kindergarten. We still like those things. We like to be recognized, and that'll help you um, get, uh, be able to achieve your initiatives. For me, um, and the mayor talked about this as well, establish common language and de definitions around what is equity, what is diversity, what is inclusion. They are different definitions, and we shouldn't be using them interchangeably. And they, they're different strategic plans that go along with that. Breaking down silos across your organizations. It's great that you have a public works department and a parks department and an HR department, et cetera. How do those departments work together? Because if we all have the common language and the shared vision, then we should all be heading in the same direction. Maybe in a different, slightly different path and slightly different outcome, but the same direction, which should be up and something positive. Um, working with departments to provide resources and tools, and I don't just mean money. I do mean uh, staff time, maybe grant funding, et cetera. Um, and establish performance measures. What are your measures for success? What does that look like? Now, we're, if we have any time, I know it's time to go to work, it's 10.02. But if, we have, if you all have any questions, we do have a microphone here in our chairs. And we would have, be happy to entertain a few questions if you have time. 
And questions for all of us, not just me. Questions, yes. Oh, there's a stand, where's the stand? Oh, there's a stand right behind you, Elizabeth. One over there? Yes. There was one here to my right, maybe your left, and one here by the door, the left-hand side. Uh, is it on? Yes. All right, thank you so much. It's a wonderful presentation. I'm wondering in terms of uh, helping the unions understand uh, what's in it for them in terms of changing their processes and what are some of the things that have been the most effective. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Okay, we're good. <clears throat> you know, a lot of times people are afraid to approach unions because you look at it as a very adversarial kind of relationship, but every moment you interact is not adversarial. You know, we do, we can have con conversations. But when we talked earlier about building relationships, it's with the unions as well. They are not an enemy. It's just that there are times you are not on the same page. Just as you might not be with your employees, right? But you've built a relationship so that a more difficult and challenging conversation is possible. And I think we have to have the courage to be able to do that. And sometimes to get someone's attention, you got to show them what's in it for them. And what's in it for them. And you heard from him earlier today, and that's important for this uh, uh, organizational, any organizational change. Thank you again to St. Thomas for inviting us, and have a great day. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Hermerkaus. I'm the executive director of the Forum on Workplace Inclusion, and I'm here just really to thank the mayor and Tony and Andrea and Scott for this presentation today. It's been wonderful to have them here with us and, and to be able to hear what the city of St. Paul is doing uh, with their workforce, which, of course, is our workforce. Um, I also want to thank our sponsor, Best Buy, for being here, uh, for, uh, for Jason, Jason and Megan to come. Uh, they just signed up yesterday as our sponsors for this breakfast series, and we're very excited to have Best Buy as a sponsor for all three of the breakfasts this year. And of course, there are three breakfasts. I, just, I will talk about that in a minute, but I also want to, before I do anything else, remind you that the slides and the presentation today is all recorded. They'll be on our website probably later this week, maybe as late as next week. So if you wanted to look in detail at those slides, you'll be able to do that. We, of course, also have surveys on your tables and pens there. I'm not going to use the word feedback. Um, we, need, we need to know what you thought, what you want to hear more about. Those things help guide the way we plan the breakfasts and anything else that we do at the forum. Now, as far as the next breakfast, it's on February 28th. Tia Rosman Clark from Green Card Voices will be speaking. Uh, uh, she'll be talking about immigrant dialogues. I think immigration's kind of in the news right now. Uh, we want to hear more about uh, the immigrant experience here in the Twin Cities, specifically. You can register for that online uh, on our website at forumworkplaceinclusion.org. Uh, we also have a webinar series that happens every month. Our next one is actually December 13th. Uh, it, they are free of charge. This one's going to be about engaging your Asian talent. Uh, we have Florence Chan from uh, an NGO by the name of Community Business based in Hong Kong who will be doing that presentation for us. We're negotiating times because right now she's speaking at midnight Hong Kong time, so that time might flex a little bit from what's on our website. You can also register for that at forumworkplaceinclusion.org, forumworkplaceinclusion.org. Uh, and of course, the big event of the year for us is the uh, annual conference that'll be over at the Minneapolis Convention Center on April 16th through the 18th. Uh, that's 1,600 some people last year from 45 states and 15 countries. And you might think that people who come to the conference are DNI and HR professionals, and it's true, about half of them are. But the other half of those people are everybody else who works in any workplace anywhere, because if you're going to create an inclusive workplace, it takes all of us. And so every one of us needs to have an, a level of expertise about what diversity, equity, and inclusion means to us and our organizations. And so therefore, this conference is for everyone. And we encourage you to be a part of the forum conference coming up in April. 
also want to call, call out one last thing before we go, the Doherty Family College. And if you want to work with it, our, our students as interns, Chris is over here and I'm sure she's got cards and all kinds of stuff that she can talk to you about in order for you to engage with the Doherty Family College. Um, I think that's all I've got. We're really happy to have you here today and we'll see you at the next breakfast in February. Thanks everyone, have a great day.